Hi, hello, welcome to Telivana Radio webinar on immigration, USA immigration. Uh, today is a short and uh, very important. Uh, uh, we we bring today very short and important information to on update information on update uh, update on 485 process. So today maybe it will take uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Maybe you can uh, post your question or maybe you can call and you can ask within this limit. So anyway, we we are continue on we can do on uh, on Wednesday, so you can come up the more questions and uh, so we will come up the more information as per today November second. The court given some certain uh, injection on I nine four four. So today we have uh, Lucas Garrison, attorney from Burgos and Garrison Law Firm. So we can invite today. So welcome, Lucas. Welcome to, to today's show. Hi, Venkat. Thank you for having me. It's uh, uh, good to hear from you. Hope you had a good weekend. Yes, thank you. Yeah, how was the day? You know, today is the first day of November. I think the last month is a very busy day. Busy month to processing and applying the 485. So one question is, a. Uh, uh, and November visa bulletin uh, released on Thursday. So what is USCIS is accepting on filing date or final action date? Uh, from I believe everything is still on filing date for USCIS. Um, and we're going to continue filing. The uh, dates did not progress or move you know, at all. So everything's the same. And it's going to remain probably remain the same this month uh, and then we'll see the major change probably in uh, December bulletin <clears throat> based upon how many applications have been received but some good news uh, and this has been something that's been going back and forth all year um, this this uh, uh, administration has uh, included a new uh, um, threshold for people to meet when they're trying to uh, apply for adjustment of status and that is a public charge uh, where you have to show that you're not going to be a public charge, that you have certain liquid assets and things like this has caused uh, quite a bit of a headache over the past uh, few months where we have to work with all of our clients to help gather information like credit report, uh, mortgage statements, what the value, the home appraisal value, things like this. Uh, so you know, in February or March of this year, it was introduced. There was a court case that paused it for some time. Then the court case uh, was appealed and the appellate court stood with uh, the agency, USCIS, on implementing the rule. So it was reinstated. And then now today, a court uh, has uh, basically said uh, it's not a valid rule and suspending that requirement uh, for the time being. Uh, based upon violations of the Administrative uh, Procedures Act, which means that, you know, uh, the USCIS more or less overstepped its bounds in, the, for, in requiring these additional requirements to show that you have certain credit score, credit worthiness to uh, uh, file an adjustment of status application. So uh, twofold here. What does this mean for my case if I've already filed? Well, uh, in essence, it was a lot of extra work and an exercise of gathering evidence and preparing packages that uh, it's just, I guess, good for practice at this point <laughs> because they're not going to be used. Uh, they'll still be considered part of your file, but they're going to be discarded and not adjudicated. Uh, and for anyone else moving forward um, for any filing this month, you know, we can also go ahead and exclude those and you know might be a good idea for attorney or if you're filing on your own to include a copy of the order suspending that rule so uh, in the next month these any new filings is probably gonna be a little bit easier more streamlined because we don't have to get all this extra evidence yes it's a really good news for the who are processing the 485 and when so can you give the background of uh, I I nine four four when it was implemented and uh, we seen in a uh, uh, couple of months ago the USC has uh, uh, denied the four eighty five due to the not attached the I nine four four. So how it is? Uh, just uh, we can we can uh, we can go step by step. Can you give the when it was implemented I nine I I nine four four? 
Yes. So the whole process was began this February or March uh, of 2020. And uh, immediately when this final rule was established, uh, there was court cases challenging that USCIS didn't have the authority or DHS didn't have the authority or follow the correct procedures to even implement this rule. Uh, so there was some confusion at the time. How do we file to not have a rejection? Uh, you know, do we need to still include this or not? Uh, USCIS pulled the form from their website and then later added it back. So um, my rule of thumb, whenever I file any case, I always want to make sure we cover any possible outcome. And so what does this mean? We want to make sure your package is complete. We want to make sure that all, you know, just like all forms need to be signed, all information's correct, all supporting evidence is included. If there's a doubt to what needs to be filed for the whole package to be accepted, we'd rather err on the side of caution and send what we need. Uh, so that started, you know, back in August or so of this year where there was still an exemption. In fact, uh, until I think the October 4th, uh, even some of these cases for the, you know, with these newer GCs uh, for EB3 downgrades, EB2, didn't technically require the 944. Now, we still provided those just to avoid any rejection. So. Uh, now, I think hopefully this is just going to add more clarity so there's not as many rejections based upon uh, filing or not filing with this. But, uh, it's, you know, basically to sum up the whole argument of what we've all been upset about as immigration attorneys is, you know, our, our immigration system is supposed to accept everyone. Uh, and we're supposed to, if you qualify for a benefit and you're not inadmissible, which means you you're not there's something you've done that would negate your qualifications to be here legally, like a criminal background, certain health related grounds or political affiliations, then everyone should be looked at equally. And we should measure someone's ability to come to the country and be uh, either a legal permanent resident or a citizen based upon, uh, you know, what their income might be or what their, uh, assets might total or, you know, what, what, you know, their retirement account might be or credit score. We, we want to include everyone equally. And, um, you know, I think now this is a good step moving forward. This is probably the third or fourth case in a row where the Donald Trump administration has uh, lost on some of these policies they've implemented. Now, hopefully this trend uh, continues for the adjusted uh, Department of Labor wage uh, levels that increased, and then also for you know this new proposed rule for H-1B um, cap subject petitions with the lottery, where you know we don't want you know people to have to turn into bidders to say I'm going to pay my employee the highest wage so they know I know they get chosen. So hopefully things continue in a positive manner, and uh, things can somewhat go back to normal. Yeah, Lucas, we can discuss um, high wages and uh, in uh, next year, 2021, um, the random selection, maybe lottery is going away and uh, getting the new rules. But before that, uh, just I want to discuss on this uh, I-944. So last October or uh, September, uh, from who applied in March to October, uh, who applied the 485 in March to October to 2020, U.S. has uh, denied the process. The reason, today, the new, the case is uh, uh, injunction on these rules. So is the this application, rejected application, what is the status? They want to reapply or they want to uh, open the, the same case or they want to reapply the entire the process? What is the situation in those cases? Well, so if there was any case where that occurred, where someone had a case denied based upon this, you could obviously file uh, a motion to reopen or reconsider. You could uh, proceed uh, that route. You could refile. Uh, potentially, if, if the only reason your case was denied was not including this form, uh, you might even be able to uh, uh, have other remedies, such as filing in federal court which might be a faster way of getting the situation resolved uh, where a U.S. attorney would, 
you know, more or less act as a liaison between you and Department of Homeland Security, and that would allow, you know, faster adjudication of the case if, if that was the only reason there was a denial. Um, you know, so it is good news. Uh, we, what we like, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the government, you're dealing with agencies, it's always best to have somewhat of a status quo so people have the comfort and knowledge to know, like, as long as I follow this process, my case will be accepted. If there's a, any clerical issue or anything wrong, someone will issue a request for evidence, uh, you know, not just flat out deny my case. So, you know, hopefully we can kind of get back to some of the normal processing and nor- normal uh, adjudication of these cases. Okay. So Lucas, I have a one question on I- I-944. Why the USCIS was implemented this rule? Did say, did say, the USCIS did... Um, uh, suspected all 485 applications have some illegal activities or something. Why it, this form bring to the 485? Well, to get into a very high overview of what the purpose of, uh, was for this program, it goes back to the president's idea that he only wants to have the best and brightest immigrants coming to this country. Um, now, I don't know how you can define who's best and who's brightest or who's going to contribute more or who's going to contribute less to our economy or to our country. Um, you know, th- there's some people who have skilled trade uh, who might be, you know, key to our infrastructure as far as construction or other uh, industries. It, just as important as there are, you know, DevOps engineers. You know, I don't know how you can quantify how who's more important than someone else and what they were trying to do with this is to say look you know someone who might be a a, a certain background or might have a family-based petition or might come here based upon an asylum claim is uh they have to prove more that they're not going to be a charge you know or be a public burden and um even though they qualify for all other benefits you know they're the idea is to say that, well, you need to prove that you're not going to cost us money, the taxpayers, right? Uh, and we only want the best and brightest immigrants to come here because obviously they would take care of themselves. We wouldn't have to worry about that. So that's the idea of where this comes from. And, and, and again, that's not, you know, we have many, many different parts of our immigration system. Employment-based immigration just happens to be one of those parts. Uh, H-1B visa holders happens to be just one of those parts, you know, and we have asylum, we have things like a U visa, T visa, VAWAs, these are victims of crimes or victims of domestic violence. We have people who claim political asylum, you know, where they're not safe to live in their own home country. Uh, We have other uh, family unity concepts where we have someone who might be a legal permanent resident or a citizen Uh, for they have the right to petition for an immediate relative, okay? These are all different concepts within one framework of immigration. Uh, And it's important to remember that um, merit-based or employment-based immigration is not the only facet to our immigration system. Uh, And just much like uh, a lot of the attentions on uh, a group we call DREAMers, who were, uh, you know, minor children who were bought here whenever they were, you know, babies and they grew up in the United States and they still don't have any legal status. You know, they're just as important as anyone who's uh, in a backlog for EB2 or EB3 uh, from India. So we want to look at everyone equally and we want to make sure the system works equally for everyone. Okay. So by this uh, court injection, maybe court... um denied this uh, new rule so in going forward we should not attach it's not required to attach the 485 process right correct so from november 2nd today moving forward it's no longer required to you know submit the 944 you know credit score tax records anything outside the ordinary now you know for employment based uh, adjustments of status, we're not required to submit affidavits of support, 
uh, or anything else to show, uh, you know, any sponsorship because you have a, a job. Uh, now, if you're then kind if you're petitioning for your parents and you're a U.S. citizen, um, based upon that, part of that process would be you would still need to have an affidavit of support, show your taxes, things like this, and make a commitment for 10 years. So if anything were to happen, you're going to, you know, help take care of them. You know, that that is still going to remain the same, but this extra burden of showing, you know, credit scores, assets, retirement funds, you know, savings accounts, that's that's no longer required. And even if you do submit uh, pretty much once USCIS receives that, it's going to be bound for, you know, shredder. It's not going to be uh, <laughs> it's not okay. going to be considered. It means only employee based uh, the 485 process, uh, we should not include this I-994. The remaining, maybe we need to continue to add the 48, right? Family based, or maybe you said there's a T visa, V visa, or J visa, or something else. Family based. Visa. Well, the, these other visas, they, you know, certain requirements might have an affidavit of support where you have to have someone support you, a sponsor, okay? Uh, and that's not going to change. But as far as uh, employment base goes, um, you know, these additional, well, for everyone, the 944 is not going to be required. But for empl employment based, you're not required to have a sponsor, any uh, type of sponsorship, uh, you know, for an affidavit of support. Okay. I think uh, pretty much uh, the information about the 4944, uh, I-9, I-944. Just, uh, I have a question on the October visa bulletin process. Did you see any information while downgrade to EB2, EB3, the petition got denied or something? Or I would say not, I, I wouldn't use the word denied. I would use- No, it meant uh, uh, maybe I can rejected. add one more point. Yeah, maybe I can uh, uh, add one more point. Let's say while downgrade to EB2, EB3, uh, it should be attached the form is required to attach or no so uh if you're downgrading or you're going to rely on a, a labor that was or perm that was previously filed uh all that's required is you know we want to reference the previously filed perm or eta 9089 form we want to know the date it was filed we want to know the uh, expiration date uh, once it was certified and then you know uh you can request uscis to uh reference that and they can get a copy of that or have it from a previous uh previously approved uh petition you know pull it from that file so um you know there's i think that answers that question there's not you know um i don't know if there's any other clarification you need from me on on that no somewhere i saw it it meant um it got denial because of not attached the perm, original perm or something. So is it true or not? It's not true. So I'm a member of a group of American Immigration Lawyers Association. We have thousands and thousands of immigration attorneys that collaborate and work together. Okay. Uh, part of this, we have also our own community of where we share information. So some people have filed these uh, I, downgrade I-140s without the original labor. And they've also included uh, a request for premium processing. Um, I typically don't do this, but some people do. And, you know, technically, if you're if you filed your original I-140 with the Texas Service Center and you're now you're downgrading and you're filing again with the Texas Service Center, uh, quote unquote, sometimes the officers can go and pull your previous file and then you know, you, they'll like honor the premium processing at the time of filing. Uh, earlier this month or in October, uh, some people s still try to do that. And in those cases were rejected, not so much denied, but rejected. Now, a lot of attorneys, and I don't want to, you know, um, state who they are, but there's a lot of people who have sent memos, letters, or, or emails, or newsletters, something saying that, well, if you don't have the original uh, labor and you're trying to downgrade, your case is going to be rejected or denied, okay? Uh, that's not true. There's nowhere in the regulations or the law that says that you, that, that would be true. 
And even if it were true, how can an attorney who filed your labor in 2013 with your I-140, how can they still have your original I-140 uh, labor? It, it, you know, they don't. They sent it to USCIS uh, when they filed the I-140. So even they don't. And then, you know, some people say, well, they have the original signatures and all this. Well, I always send a copy of the perm when we're downgrading or doing anything with the I-140 as a record. And yes, that's true. I do send that. I don't have to have original signatures. I don't have to have anything else. What happens is I use that for reference when it goes to the officer. When the case goes to USCIS, what happens is they're going to actually pull the blue pages of your actual ETA, or if they don't have, they're going to request a duplicate copy from the Department of Labor, and they're going to have the actual signed ETA that was signed and submitted in 2013. There's nothing new that you can attest to. There's nothing new. It, it, what's filed is filed. And uh, there's uh, people say this uh, because if, if Vincat is your attorney, and Venkat filed your case in 2013, he doesn't want Lucas to come here and take the case from him. So he's going to say these things so he doesn't lose that business. And that's really, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate people do that. But that's really the only thing I can think of to, to know why people would say such a thing is just to try and keep the business where they don't, you know, they, can, they don't have to worry about losing someone to another attorney. Okay. So, Lucas, do you see uh, the October applicants, 485 pros applicants, are getting receipts or something, or do you see any receipts? Or we should be receiving receipts uh, in the next uh, two to three weeks. Typically, okay. uh, when we file <laughs> I-140s with the with the um, adjustment status app uh, package together concurrently, it's going to take four to six weeks. Uh, that's what I've told all of my uh, clients to expect four to six weeks at the earliest. Uh, there could be some delays just based on the fact that there's 20,000, 25,000 extra applications that are submitted on top of a normal processing load. Uh, USCIS could delay that some, but uh, typically uh, don't panic. Um, even this means also checks. It's gonna, they're going to take four to six weeks to process checks. So uh, if you notice the check sitting there, it's not cashed uh, or anything else, don't panic. It, it typically will take a little bit of time for that receipt to come and for the check to be processed. Okay. So, yeah, maybe uh, we can discuss about this uh, H-1B higher wages and in um, 2021 H-1B new process exemption for the process so where we have this code injection on h1b labor wages high do you see any information from court or yeah so right now the main case uh that i'm following is one from uh american immigration lawyers association or aila uh, they filed with a few universities uh, as plaintiffs and you know we're still in the process of gathering uh information to show the damages how how this could be damaging to business how it could be damaging to other people so we're getting examples so we can show the court evidence to to show why they should issue an injunction because there's irreparable harm okay that's what we need to show to get that uh, um, uh, injunction and and just saying oh, this is bad, this is going to hurt us without any supporting evidence to really, you know, have substance to that claim. Uh, the court's really not going to, you know, uh, listen to, to, to us very long if we do that. So we have to have a, quite a bit of evidence. Um, and hopefully this week, you know, everything should be submitted and hopefully we'll have some type of news uh, that's moving positive. I will say this, there's some people that are using, you know, alternative wage surveys, and that's fine. But it's not an a easy answer to the entire process. Um, USCIS can easily challenge through RFEs these wage uh, surveys. So it's not a, a stopgap by any means. It's, it's good 
you know, to use uh, on a case by case basis if there is an issue. But I, I would be very careful about processing these uh, wage surveys, you know, for like 100 cases in one month. You know that you're going to get quite a few RFEs, and it's going to be quite a headache if, if you rely on for pretty much standard business. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So about the H1B21 process, maybe we can discuss on Wednesday. Very elaborative. Yeah. So. We know that uh, it's going to be changed the process, a random lottery to the high wages process. So we can discuss on Wednesday on uh, the 6 p.m. show. So uh, we will, so you, if you have any questions, maybe you can post in Facebook. So quickly we try to give the answer or else uh, we can going to be end the show today and uh, we will connect on Wednesday. So yeah, meanwhile, uh, Lucas, you can share if anything you want to share today. Uh, I think we covered everything. I just, you know, if we can close, I'd like to just say, you know, again, like and follow uh, Telugu NRI Radio with Vincat uh, for any updates or also our law firm page, uh, Burgos and Garrison Law. And uh, we try and update uh, as soon as the news post. And that's why we're doing this uh uh, Facebook Live event right now. We want to make sure the community is up to date with uh, all the information as soon as it happens. So uh, if there's if no one has any questions, you know we'll be ready on on Wednesday to go with our normal show. Yeah, thank you. The thanks, Lucas. A quick uh, show today, thirty minute show, to provide the very valuable information to the community. So viewers, uh, you know we we are doing every Wednesday on six p.m. Central Time. You can connect on every. Wednesday, so you can post your question on Facebook page, or you can send an email to info at i b g i m m blog dot com. Or if you have any questions, or maybe if you, if you want to clarify any topic, just send an email, or you can post. So Lucas is ready to explain or provide the valuable information to you. So thanks, Lucas. Thanks for joining today, and uh, thanks everyone to join today's show. So um, we are going to be end the show. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you.